Hello, it's Demestral, Pickup Truck Plus SUV Talk, and my passion is pickups and SUVs. I'm here in Japan. I'm overlooking Tokyo Bay in Yokohama. I'm getting ready to leave today. Sadly, my Japan trip is ending. However, I did get a chance to t sit down with Toyota Chief Engineer Mike Swears. If you don't know who Mike Swears is, he's a pretty important guy for Toyota truck fans. He's one of the last decision makers for what new products get unveiled, what new features get unveiled in the Tundra and Tacoma, I should say, and the Forerunner, Sequoia, and the FJ Cruiser that's not sold in the US. He oversees all the body on frames for Toyota. Uh, that's an important segment in the company. It's growing and there's a lot of energy behind it. So I wanted to make sure I came here and talked to him specifically about what's the future of Toyota looking like. Learning more about Toyota trucks and what they're doing and it may just be a lot of news coming forward from Toyota. So see the exciting times for them as really right now. So it's gonna be interesting to see what's gonna happen. So hey, thanks for watching. And uh, without further ado, here we go. All right, Mike, let's talk about trucks because we love trucks, I love trucks. And uh, we've talked many times over the years. But let's start first of all, that we're not in Michigan. We're not even in the same like area of Michigan. We're in Japan. Yes, we are. So what are you doing in Japan? Uh, I have different roles. Um, so, of course, I have my responsibilities in, on the North American side. But I also have uh, responsibilities on, on the, of course, the TMC side uh, for CB company. So a few years back, uh, TMC, uh, Toyota Motor Corporation, broke off, similar to some of our competitors. And we've focused on different business units uh, handling different products and it's been really great on the truck side because now I'm not competing with uh, the sedans or the small SUVs uh, truck is truck and uh, you know where our focus is body on frame vehicles so I'm over here uh, have a, a little more responsibility than before including Forerunner and uh, because Forerunner is built in Japan um, that's one of the reasons I'm over here. Yeah, so you, you got promoted last time I saw you doing Tacoma, Tundra, Sequoia, and Forerunner. Forerunner and FJ. And FJ. That still exists not in North America. Not in North America. Right. So congratulations for the promotion or no. more role or whatever you want to take for that. Um, but also like, holy cow, because trucks and SUVs are blowing up and now you're kind of the epicenter of the growth in the marketplace. We've seen new trucks all over the place. Well, I mean, from Japan, you're such a distance away. Are, are you are you at like two o'clock in the morning like checking out news stories? I mean, what, what are you doing with this stuff? I mean, it's got to be a lot going on, right? There there is a lot going on in the segment, and uh, you just saw I think was released that trucks gone have gone over seventy percent of the market share now. Trucks being light duty trucks, including right, right. SUVs, but uh, the the focus in North America has changed, and uh, one of the reasons I'm over here is to bring that change to TMC. And how do we get the resources? How do we allocate our projects? How do we look at future product as well um, uh, for all of North America and what best suits the North American market? And do you find that a little bit difficult? Because we've been driving around quite a bit today and I'm playing, you know, journalists, checking out every truck I see and vehicles I see around. And trucks over here are work trucks. I mean, that's, that's every time you see it. it's a key truck with a bed, it's the only thing you see. And so do you find that like culturally there's a little bit of difference in, in people understanding what's going on in North America? The understanding of trucks has always been a, an issue for us. And uh, it's one of the reasons I'm in the role I'm in is to, to bring that knowledge to Japan. And uh, Japan, just like any other company, uh, when we're working on a product, we don't do everything in one area. So the resources are allocated globally and... Uh, we have different areas of special specialization in those specialization areas. Some are in Japan, some are in North America, we, in Europe for different products are done. So yeah, you know, to answer your question, uh, is it easy for the Japanese staff to understand the North American pickup? No. It's the same as if you're in Japan right now, you'll see a lot of what they call a cake category car, one little tiny cars. If you ask someone in North America to work on that vehicle, we'd have no idea how to do it right. because it's a completely different segment for us than what we're familiar with. So, you know, uh, trucks being, uh, I work in CV company, which is commercial vehicle company. You know, we think of trucks, body on frame vehicles as commercial vehicles. But the reality of it is North America, most of them are, um, you know, uh, 
sold as retail, they're not sold as fleet vehicles. And that's where our focus as Toyota has always been. We don't really dabble in the fleet in the North America side. Now on the Japan side, interesting enough, is the Hilux has been brought back to the Japanese market. And uh, we're starting to see, you know, interest in Japan growing in trucks as well. And how it, right down to, you know, when we talk about off-road, uh, another company builds a very small case type off-road vehicle that's very popular here and in the states it, it still has some some following though you have to bring it in under the gray market right right so let's talk about something you do build here we talk about forerunner mm -hmm. and forerunner is a really interesting product i just was in moab and did some stuff in ura and it's one of those products that you don't hear a whole lot about in the press you don't do hear a whole lot about um, competitors it tends to get bashed right it seems like it's a weird thing but it's like one of the most capable vehicles of an SUV that you have. It's an iconic nameplate. It's been around forever. I know several of your PR people actually drive 4Runners. They love them so much. So why do you think that people are abandoning the, the body-on-frame segment? Like Nissan doesn't have anything anymore. Uh, maybe Ford's going to bring something back to Bronco. It's always up in here. So what's going on with that? Well, you were up 8.3% in sales yes. year over year. I mean, what's going on with that? Uh, you know it. The market itself, there's always demand for that more capable vehicle. And uh, as uh, different companies exit it, that, that segment, of course, uh, there's still an interest in the segment. Uh, the interesting thing about Forerunner is as everybody has downsized and went to monocoque or unibody type vehicles, uh, they've left out that adventure type uh, uh, person that's really interested in uh, maybe not going off road all the time, but you know they they hunt, they fish, uh, they have families that they need to take hunting and fishing. Um, they have dirt bikes, so on and so forth, and their lifestyle is very active. And we build vehicles for the SUV mar market, like Highlander. It's a great vehicle. It's a great vehicle for hauling a family, but it really doesn't fit into that that family who is really. Uh, outdoorsy, they like to camp and, and fish and hunt and do these type of activities. So as you said, the Forerunner is a very capable, body on frame makes a very capable vehicle. And allowing that, that extra uh, capability to get wherever you want to go as a family on your adventure and get back, uh, you know, it really appeals to, to a wide range of, of customers. And especially young families uh, truly enjoy this type of vehicle. So we're seeing it grow, and we're seeing uh, more interest in the Forerunner just because of what it can do over the competition uh, from a monocoque or, or a unibody type vehicle. Now, there, there were some rumors, and I reported on them, and I doubt you're going to tell me the answer here, but I'm going to ask you anyways. There was some discussion about Forerunner getting killed. I've heard from different sources. Do you think that that is just because the way the product has gone, that, that those rumors are starting up because everybody else has left the segment? Or do you think that there's really some people saying, you know, gosh, the new Pathfinder is just capable as a, as a unibody, and boy, the, the new SUVs, unibody, are, are just as capable as what most Americans need. We don't need to get that much in the dirt and that much uh, in the mud. Maybe most customers don't, but there's also an image that goes with it. And uh, capability of the vehicle, uh, every company has its own way of measuring capability. But it's very difficult to get a monocoque vehicle to do the same thing. Uh, that uh, uh, body on frame. You don't have the compliancy of the frame. And if you do put your vehicle in, in some difficult off-camber situations, uh, you know, wheel lift is a, is a big part of getting power. So uh, a monocoque probably can go some places. I, I love to see uh, my competition advertise uh, monocoques at maybe you should never go off-road and they're trying to show you, yeah, we're driving down a gravel road and it's very capable. It can do what some of these other vehicles can do, but we all know it can't do that. And it doesn't really have the image of doing that. They're trying to create this image, but the reality of it is um, maybe 45% of our customers of forerunners claim they go off-road and to different extents, but 45% of our customers go off-road compared to uh, like a Highlander where we get 12% of our customers say they actually take their vehicle off-road. So it's really supporting uh, a desire of the customer who's purchasing that vehicle 
And uh, it's interesting to me, you know, to hear people go, well, it, it's going to go away. Well, we heard that with Tundra. We heard that with Tacoma. We, we hear that all the time, especially when some of the uh, competitors start leaving the segment. Then, you know, the first thing you want to report on is, well, everybody's going to leave the segment. It's gone instead. But the reality is there's still a base of customers that desire this. And for Forerunner, for the midsize SUV, that base is actually growing. So let's talk about the, I always saw the, the forgotten stepchild of Toyota's vehicle lineup, the Sequoia, right? I mean, it just seems like anytime I talk to customers, they forget it exists. Like, damn, the Sequoia, you built a three-row SUV, full size what? So you sold, uh, let's see, you sold 11,000 units last year. You were uh, down 8.8%. But what I think is interesting in Sequoia is, and I've talked to other manufacturers about this as well, you look at the three-row SUV market. Now you got Tahoe and Yukon. You're a Michigan guy. I grew up in Michigan. What do you do in Michigan? You go up north. What do you see on I-75 going north? You see Tahoe's and Yukon's, right? And you have the Escalade. We have new vehicles coming out in those segments they're doing and stuff. Uh, I just drove a Ford Expedition. Uh, Lincoln Navigator's doing stuff. These vehicles have a high dollar price point. You know they got tons of profit in them. But nobody's competing with the, the, the big two or three in that segment. Why do you think Toyota, is, we have it, but we haven't done a lot with it? What, what do you think the hang-up is there? Uh, we haven't done a lot with it, and the biggest issue for that full-size SUV is the cat fay and greenhouse gas uh, requirements, uh, where they're at today and where they're going in the future, and how to keep that alive. It's, it's, uh, it has a larger footprint, which is helpful, but we team that with a large engine, and a large engine usually doesn't get the fuel economy or the emissions that a smaller SUV would, would get. But that segment, again, uh, surprisingly, uh, we heard rumors, and I think Ford has said to themselves, they were getting out of the segment, and they reinvested in it. And we're seeing uh, uh, other competitors reinvest in that segment. And out of the segment, is what we're finding out is millennials now are the, our new customers. And uh, it was a little surprising. Millennials are buying full size. Millennials are But millennials full-size. don't buy cars. Uh, some millennials do buy cars, and the ones with families uh, are rejecting minivans, and they're going to this full-size SUV. Uh, I, I don't, I don't want to say it's anti-soccer mom, but you can get a very nice vehicle, and it's, it seats the same amount of passengers as a one-box or a minivan does, but yet it has its own image, and it's very comfortable. Uh, you, you've driven some of the different ones. Uh, a Sequoia is a very comfortable ride, especially if you're going on a long trip. So the, the family who, who goes camping in that and uh, they're putting in a tent probably is buying a 4Runner. Yeah. If the family who is towing a trailer and going camping, they're probably buying a Sequoia. Yeah. So let's get to your other adventure-ready vehicles. The theme here is adventure, if you think it's adventure, trust us. Uh, t- Tacoma. We've had, over the years, I've enjoyed spending time with the Tacomas. We've driven them. we had a great time with them. But it seems like lately, that midsize market blew up. And I know you and I have talked in the past that said, hey, Tim, I can do more with Tacoma if I had more competition. Well, congratulations, Mike. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> you got Gladiator. You got, you got Ford Ranger. You got pot shots in the media. You got a lot going on in that segment. But it seems like it's that adventure-ready part of the segment, the TRD Pro part of the segment that really is blowing up. Is that, is that what you're seeing? Is it really just that sense of adventure? Uh, you know, that demographic for a compact truck, or we call a compact truck, a mid-size truck is, is a little bit different than, than a full-size truck. And if you try to make a, a baby full-size truck, you'll, you'll sell some, but you're, you're not going to really hit uh, the segment as it's... it's demographic is demanding so again it's it's an adventure so when you look at forerunner as you asked before and we look at tacoma what we see is a customer that is very active and they really appreciate having the extra capability they really appreciate the style of the truck and uh you know we can talk about capability but you should back it up with actual uh, true capability in the vehicle itself and what they're looking for is that adventure machine and they're, they're very active customers. So, uh, you know, everybody keeps asking us, are you afraid of the competition coming in? No, we're, we're really not. We welcome the competition. It's helping the segment grow. Uh, as you know, we've added plant capacity, and we just, we're just adding more plant capacity. Uh, questions I got was, well, aren't you afraid to add plant capacity with competition? Well, we're selling every truck we can. 
Uh, we added capacity and we're still selling every truck we can. And so it's a, it's a segment that hasn't uh, seen the love that maybe the full size segment has seen over the years. But, uh, you know, when everybody thought we were crazy for staying in the segment, now everybody, everyone that said we were crazy is coming back into the segment again. And I think uh, as we move towards the future, uh, there's, there's a lot of excitement about it with the extra competition, not just on, uh, you know, the low end side, but on the, the high end premium off road side, uh, the adventure side, um, the competition is good. It's going to drive a more creative product in the future. And, uh, I think, uh, truly what you're going to start seeing is how do we make, how do we meet the, the government requirements and still offer that, that vehicle a customer wants. Yeah, sure. And speaking of capacity, so people don't know, you expanded the Baja facility. You have a new plant in Mexico. Can you say the name? I can't say the name. I can't say the name. All right, we call it GT. Did you call it GT? <laughs> GT plant. There's a new plant in Mexico. There's new 2020, the plant in Baja. And so now you're going to have, from a capacity standpoint, you're limited. You were doing 6040 in San Antonio with Tacoma, Tundras, and kind of still everything you had. And, and people have talked about a lot about you were about 10, 15% below what you could sell. You just at that, that cusp. But you talking, you sold 245,000 Tacomas last year. If you had that capacity, you were just barely short of 100,000 difference between you and the Camry. So as Camry's dropping, it was down 11% year over year. If that does again, you had capacity. Can you imagine a Toyota company where Tacoma sells as much as a Camry? Oh. It's different segments and different customers. <laughs> right, but that's still... But, uh, yeah, it's it's really, you know, bringing that segment back to uh, before we had uh, the Lima shock and that. Uh, compacts were selling quite well and uh, for different reasons. Uh, but now it's a very desirable truck for a cer certain de demographic, right? So it doesn't mean everybody is going to move from a full size to a compact. Truly, what, at least for Toyota, we have different customers. Uh, for those two trucks and uh, uh, we need to make sure our trucks are meeting each customer's need. So the one complaint I always give to the Tacoma is consistently, why is the resale value so high? Why do people, like, you can't go buy a used one, people just go buy new ones instead. Why do you think the resale is so high in those trucks? I, I like to say it's because of the chief engineer. but uh, <laughs> Sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, you know, it's it's the product, and it gets back to why we sell trucks. You know, we, we aren't the most innovative in the segment, but we have the best QDR. And when you, you look at the quality, the reliability, the durability, um, that is our, our bread and butter. That's what we focus on. So... We always say it's, you know, you can go anywhere in any vehicle, but uh, you need a Toyota to get back. And uh, it, it's interesting because in the position I'm in now, you know, I get to see Australia, I get to see uh, Asia Pacific market and these different markets. And especially like Australia, where you start talking out back in that, the number one vehicle is a Toyota. And the reason it is because going somewhere can be a life or death situation. So... We sell on quality, reliability, durability, and uh, these are things that keep our resale value, value high. You know when you buy a Toyota that uh, even if it has 100,000, 150, 200,000 miles on it, that you're expecting to get probably the same as the second customer or the third customer. And speaking of seeing that demographics, different areas you're looking at, are you seeing a growth in like the Hilux of different products? Worldwide, like are truck sales going up, or is it just a U.S. phenomenon? It's uh, it really uh, globally we're seeing truck sales and SUV sales go up. So the sedan market is is declining globally. Um, Japan's a little bit different, um, but uh, if we look at some of the the European market or or even if I mentioned Australia, we're looking at Australian market. Uh, we're seeing regulation changes, and that's forcing some of the customers' flavor, plus just customers' desire to have something different and the advantages of, of SUVs and pickups in the market. But, uh, you know, if we look at Australia, the regulation for towing, they're becoming very strict about how much you can tow or, um, you know, what type of vehicle can, can tow what type of trailer. 
and they do a lot of towing. Australian market is very similar to the North American market. Yep. So that's driving people's interest in, in uh, moving from maybe a small SUV to a pickup or a large SUV um, to gain that extra GVW that's necessary so that you can take that load down the road that you want to. Yeah, I've been getting a lot on this channel, a lot of questions from Australia. It seems like that market is changing the, from towing regulation stuff. And they're like, we need bigger trucks. You know, the RV market's growing down there. Things are changing. Do, do you ever see in, uh, probably would in the future, but do you see that as well from your side? Do you see the customers really demanding more towing? Do you think that eventually Tundra, is, I, we're going to get Tundra here in a minute, but I know that Tundra is just North America, but it seems like there's a business case there somewhere. Uh Maybe, maybe not. It's, you know, those things have to be looked at because you're talking right-hand drive versus left-hand drive. So the minute you ship to Australia, you need to, to, to make a right-hand drive version. And um, some of our competitors tried being in Australia a full-size truck, and, and it didn't work out for them. The, the business case just isn't there. In the future, will that change? Maybe. Uh, it's something that uh, I think every com company is looking at and, and how to meet each segments or each region's uh, uh, demands. Um, but what we do know is uh, towing capacity is very important. And with the government regulations in Australia, towing is becoming more uh, stringent and difficult. So even the vehicles we're sending over to Australia right now, we're looking at how we can increase our towing capability uh, to meet that demand. So it's not that uh, you know, the, the vehicle isn't capable, it's really coming back to the same thing we see in North America. Trailers are getting bigger. People's appetites for trailers are getting bigger. And what we notice uh, also, you know, we have snowbirds near from, from the north. We have snowbirds in the U.S. They have gray nomads, they call them. So retired people with a lot of disposable income, and uh, they're buying large travel trailers, RVs, and they're traveling Australia. So... Uh, how to meet that growing segment as well, that new segment that's, that Australia is seeing. Talk about trying to get away from everything. Yeah, take your boat and RV down to Australia. All right, let's get to your baby. Let's talk Tundra. <laughs> Got to talk Tundra. So Tundra, we're looking at the years, 118,000 units, 1.4% uh, growth, which is, you're going to tell me it was probably just related to the uh, product mix in San Antonio. See, so, yeah, I answered your own question for you. All right, so the, uh, the, there's so many changes going on in full-size trucks. There's so much growth going on in full-size trucks. I, I, I maybe should ask you the, the basic questions. Is that all right? So, Tundra Heavy Duty. I get asked the question all the time. Give me your stock answer. What do you think? Will you ever go Tundra Heavy Duty? No. Okay. So Tundra Diesel. Any ever point in the future? You you know what uh, my know answer, the answer is there. Be. He's not going to tell you about that. All right. Yeah. So there you go. If you're waiting for those two answers. There's your answers. But let's let's talk about uh, other stuff with Tundra. So there's a, I mean, no, we have spy photos. We're not going to talk about the future product coming out. But there's a lot of discussion about capacity. And we've had discussion over the years. We talked about it a little earlier. But now that you have capacity and things are changing in, in your segment, I talked to your, you, I've read your information here at CEOs, and they seem like they're still stuck on they're going to go to Tacoma. It seems like that's they're still their focus to go to Tacoma. From a, from a truck guy, from a full size truck guy perspective, you own a farm, you drive a full size truck. Man, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice if they were like, hey, let's go Tundra instead, you know, let's go ahead and do it. But do, do you think that that's the way the company's going to start really going? Is that what you're seeing? Is, is, is it going to stay compact size and be a, are you going to be a small player in a full size? Do you think that someday in the future, uh, as capacity changes, that you may say, hey, let's go roll back clock 2007. Let's go ahead and hit that market again. Let's go ahead and really make a big boom. You know, I know I, I, it's really a long it's, ask. It's, ask a, no, it's yeah. a long question. It, it's a great question. Uh, to be very honest, we're, we're kind of opposite of what our competition is. Uh, right now, we really enjoy uh, almost 50% market share in the, in the compact side. And we are, we are that niche player on the, on the full size. Uh, will we remain a niche player in the future with the capacity that we have? Um, Maybe, maybe not, to be quite honest. I, I can't really give you the answer to that because we're not focused on trying to be number one or number two in the market. So we have our D3 friends uh, down the road from us in Michigan, and their focus is who can be number one, who can be number two. Number one's pretty clear. Number two is flipping back and forth. Um, 
even if we wanted to play in that realm, we, again, don't have the capacity to do it. Uh, with the three plants that I have now building trucks, um, I would need three plants building full-size trucks to keep up with, with what their, their volume is. But with that volume comes uh, some of the things that you can't do that I'm allowed to do. So, uh, you know, Tundra right now, it's getting a little long in the tooth, but uh, our styling is, is a little polarizing, and that's on purpose. Like our styling, don't like our styling. The people who buy Tundras love our styling. That's all you, you hear about them talking about is how, how great the truck looks. And the aftermarket shows us a lot of love for, for our truck as well because the stance is nice, especially with some of the aftermarket gear on there. So you go to SEMA, you see a lot of Tundras. You see a lot of Tacomas. And really, that's our market. That's who we're appealing to. And uh, our, our customer base, again, is a little more active than our comp competition's base. Um, you know, their, their demographic's a little bit different from education and, and income and these type of things. And they're really looking for that, that truck who has good QDR, has good, you know, resale value. You mentioned that. Uh, if we just talk resale value last year, you know, it was a, a Tacoma Tundra 4Runner were the top three resale value vehicles. And people ask, well, you know, Tundra, Tundra doesn't have all these features and that. Yeah, but it, it also has a really good stance, a really good look, and it has reliability and the capability that some of our competition trucks can compete with or maybe can't compete with. I, I don't want to give my judgment. I'm right, a little right. biased. But it's really focusing on, on that, that customer. I really like where Tundra, the position Tundra is in, because uh, I, I can be a little bit out there on a style. I can be try different things or offer different features, um, and I don't have to worry about am I running two plants. You know, it's uh, really enjoying the position we're in and uh, giving the customer a product that that really says this is Toyota. This is Toyota trucks. Are you, in your experience, you've been in the full size truck world for a long time. Has it ever been as competitive as it is today? Is that many new products? That many new innovations? We got a Mild hybrid. We got a thousand foot pounds of torque from the new Ram Heavy Duty. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of noise going on. Has he ever seen this competitive? Yeah, well, it's it's uh, it's always been competitive, but it reminds me of going back to the '70s. And uh, during the '70s, there was a, a big push again. And then in the '80s, it, it, it kind of I'm an old guy, but in the '80s, it, you, you kind of saw it. Everybody just uh, started focusing back on cars and fuel economy and these type of things when, when the economy went down. But uh, the interest in trucks were always there. After, after the Lehman shock and the recession, uh, truck sales dropped, I think, from 2.5 million units down to 1.2, 1.3 million units, about half the market. The interesting thing in that is when that recession hit, uh, the premium trucks were selling well at the same rate. It was really all the lower end trucks that, that we lost sales on, we being the whole industry. And uh, when they started recovering that pent up demand, suddenly you start seeing people asking for more features, different grades, more, more premiumness, shall I say, in the full size market. Uh, the other thing we see is just kind of an evolution. You see a guy, a family that goes from a pass car, they move into a minivan, a minivan into an SUV or a large SUV. And then from that large SUV, they're moving into premium pickup trucks. And we're seeing a lot of growth from that, that as well. So, uh, you know, it's interesting to me because from the truck side, it's not just the competition. Now it's becoming... Uh, we see these new customers that are coming in and their demands are, you know, I had a luxury SUV and I kind of want the same thing in a truck and, and how to handle that. Um, that's, that's, I think, driving a lot of uh, some of the, the premium paint you're seeing or uh, the, the shelf two, shelf three leathers that oh, you yeah. would never even think to be in a pickup We're truck We're discussing before. the headliner material quality. Yes, I mean, of all things. Yeah. So it's, it's really taking, you know, people's expectations from what they had before and giving them more utility. Now, a truck guy is a truck guy. So when it comes to power, more power, the better. And we still see to, to this day 
You know, people are given, willing to give up fuel economy for the power. And uh, they'll, buy, they'll always buy torque over, over fuel economy. We as an OEM has, you know, we have to improve our fuel economy. And uh, we got the government helping us make that decision. But with that said, customers want more fuel economy, but they're demanding more power. Not that they may need the power, but there's a certain amount of braking rates, especially for a full-size truck guy, that, you know, if I have more torque than you, then my truck's better than yours. Right, right, right. We saw that with Ram press conference with a 15-foot lettering that said 1,000 foot-pounds on it. It's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, so uh, let me ask you this. From an engineering standpoint, they went from 930 to 1,000. From an engineering standpoint, is that, how much of a mountain is that to get to that level? Is that a lot of work? Is it a little work? That's, that's pretty huge, actually. Okay. Um, you have to remember that 6.7 liter Cummings started out around 520. And through the years, it's been increasing in torque. So it's not, you know, when we start talking engine changes, and engine changes are becoming more and more difficult just because of we've got emissions now, we've got fuel economy now. So you're, you're looking for the efficiency out of it. But we also really love our torque and how to get more torque out of it. So putting superchargers on them, putting turbo charges on, on them, really boost up that torque curve and, and kind of flatten it out. The problem with that is, uh, though my competition likes to say that it makes a much more fuel efficient engine, under load it's actually worse than a naturally aspirated engine. So to cool those catalysts down, you're dumping raw fuel into, that, into those, those catalysts um, to cool it down after the turbo exhaust. So, you know, you're burning rich, in other words. Right, right. And uh, burning rich means you have less fuel economy. So that's, that's a struggle for the whole industry right now, is how do you meet the customer's demand? How do you meet the regulation? And, uh, you know, the customer's demand, like I said, is torque. They want torque. But they also are expecting improved fuel economy year over year. And, and you've brought up regulations a few times. So let me ask you this. There's a lot of thoughts in the media, especially, that you guys sell the Prius. So why are you worried about fuel economy in, in the Tundra when you just take a Prius credit and apply it to the Tundra? Well, you can, you can do that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there's only so many credits to go around. And how many credits do you have to use to sell you know, we call them good boys and bad boys. How many good boys does it take to cover one bad boy? Sure. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a balancing act, and the regulation is changing. Everybody's trying to speculate where it's going to go. But the simple fact is, uh, trying to be a responsible company, we need to improve our emissions. We need to improve our fuel economy. We need to offer the customer more, but still meet the customer's request. You know, some of my other competition... We're, we're not really sure what their plans are in the future. Uh, one, one guy, you know, if you put 700 horsepower under the hood, it's a solution for everything, but you still have to meet it. And you can buy credits, there's credit trading, there's a whole bunch of things that can be done. But overall, at the end of the day, a company has to balance what they're doing. And, um, you know, as a, as a responsible environmental partner, how do we balance that as a company in totality? So a Prius isn't going to tow a 12,000-pound trailer, but uh, well, uh, we'll there's clarify. a certain... A Prius shouldn't tow a 12,000-pound trailer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you may be able to do it, but we don't recommend it. But, you know, there, there's a certain area that we, we need to look at uh, hybrids and plug-in hybrids and BEVs and these zero-emission vehicles as well. Um, you know, we, as a truck guy, I love burning through the desert in California, but there's also a pollution issue on the coast of California that selling more trucks down the coast or diesels uh, doesn't help uh, be responsible to the environment and help the environment out. So uh, there's, there's regulations, and uh, I, I'm responsible for bad boys, so... You know, I need to support. Yeah, you got as like well. all of them <laughs> on the chart I'm looking at. But but again, even on my vehicles, we're working to how do we make a cleaner truck sure. and and still meet the customer's requirements. What do you think though? Could do you ever see a time when a V8 goes away? Um, that's a really good question. It, it's a tough question to answer because you know, as a company, maybe 
maybe we say, oh, we should stop making V8s. Um, we haven't seen any of our competition do that yet, but you know, it's a V8 is difficult. Uh, smaller display, displacement engines, we can get the power out of the engines, but you know, you always hear the old the old adage: there's no replacement for displacement. And when you start making that engine work, uh, a small displacement engine is still going to work harder than a large displacement engine, turbo or non-turbo. Uh, but a large displacement engine, typically from a, an emission standpoint, is a bad boy. So how do you offer the customer what they need? I can't put a, a two liter engine in a full size truck and get it to pull 12,000 pounds uh, responsibly. But yet, you know, if I put a, a five or six liter V8 in that, that truck, how, how do I balance out the emissions and, and make sure that we're being a responsible company as well? So those are all difficult conversations that are going on um, Maybe some of them are going on here. And uh, one of my job here, again, is to bring the North American voice, the customer's voice of these are important things. How, how do I meet uh, for the future? How do I meet where maybe the North American governments are requiring us to be from a cafe, from a greenhouse gas standpoint, but still give the power, give the torque that the customer wants and needs to do the things they're doing with their, with their truck. Yeah, it's an interesting debate. So I want to get your one last thought, a um, question to you, because I know you're paying attention to this too, uh, Rivian, EV truck, 400 miles of range, whatever the torque horsepower number was. It seems incredible that they can get that much out of a, a big battery vehicle, but it does raise a question, and you got Ford doing, e, talking EV, you know, Chevy's going to start having them doing EV, you know, do, do you ever see a, a place where like an EV makes sense in a full-size truck? Um, a battery electric EV. I mean, let me clarify that. Yeah, battery electric vehicle, diesel trucks. I mean, you, you, these are questions these you're, all, you're, you're, you're debating. We're, yeah. we're, we're, we're always hearing. The, the problem with BEVs, uh, it, again, I just got done talking about zero emission vehicles. Uh, vehicles. BEV falls into a Z vehicle. Uh, zero emission is great, and I think there is a place for it in certain areas. The problem with BEVs, fuel cells, uh, plug-in hybrids, is that market is less than 2% of the overall vehicle market. And you're hearing a lot about it. You've seen a lot of uh, capital being invested in this type of vehicle, but it's 2%. So how, how do you get a return on that investment overall? At the end of the day, you know, each uh, OE needs to show some kind of return on investment. If I look at uh, uh, Tesla and what Tesla's done, um, Model 3s come out, they're, they're trying to sell Model 3 at a reasonable price, but most of the Teslas are very high priced vehicles. You brought up Rivian. Rivian, Rivian I think, has a, a very nice uh, platform that they're, they're proposing. Um, you know, the proof is in the pudding when it comes out. But what their claims are, it's very interesting. But they're also looking at a very high priced, very limited market for that vehicle to see that return on the investment. I think the better question is, do we see in the future uh, electrified trucks being available to the normal truck buyer? And is there a benefit for them to own them? Again, from an OE, from being responsible, I would love to push electric towards that market, um, but doesn't meet the customer's need. And especially when we talk a, a BEV, a battery operated vehicle, you know, you're kind of at the mercy of uh, where you can plug it in and the charge points. I just saw an article yesterday um, that were 75% short of what they think the, the charge point necessity is to, to run all these, these plug in hybrids and, and BEVs. So, can you find some place to plug in? Can you plug in at work? Can, you know, you, obviously you can plug the vehicle at home, but unlike uh, a petrol fired vehicle, uh, when you run out of gas, you, you call up AAA and they come out and bring you a gallon. When you run out of electricity, what do you do? Right. 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 And uh, especially when we start talking trucks, full size trucks, or we talk uh, uh, compact trucks, pickup trucks in, in particular, if I'm towing 12,000 pounds, can I do that with batteries? And how much electricity am I consuming during, during that? And what's activity? the range going to be too, right? Exactly. So 400 miles range is driving a, a certain cycle. 
Right. And a cycle would be like you're two people in a cab, nothing in the bed, or like a tough in the bed and four people in a cab, or different driving right. cycles. Right. At, at different speeds and so many stop and goes at a certain temperature like this. But uh, I, I don't know if you've driven some of the electric vehicles, but uh, it's a lot of fun. And, yeah, and yeah, yeah. once you put your foot in them and you start pulling, you know, 83, 100 kilowatts out of that battery at a time, uh, that battery life range starts uh, dropping dramatically. You know, it's uh, it's kind of like running your PC and running videos on it. You know, when you're you're working on an Excel file, it takes a little bit of juice, and you start running videos, and suddenly that battery is going away real quick. You know, a, a vehicle is no different, and those are some of the things that we, uh, as as an industry, need to resolve as we move forward to really make. Uh, electrification of all vehicles more practical. Uh, you live out in the country, I live out in the country. Uh, a battery-powered vehicle for me uh, is, a, is a questionable situation. Yeah. You know, would I like to have something like that? Maybe. But would I dare try to push that 400-mile range? Maybe yeah. not, right? right? Again, Michigan's really cold right now. If, if I run out of juice on, on my car, uh, what do you do? And uh, you can call people on that, but uh, I live out in the country. It takes a while. Right, right. So, huh. you know, it's from an industry, I think it's really interesting. And I think from a, uh, how to, again, be that environmentally friendly company, uh, even though we're producing a, a, a whole array of products, but also, you know, from what you can do with some of the different powertrains of the future, um, some of the performances you can get out of them. There's some advantages there as well. But finally, how to balance out what, what to do. And one of the, the successes behind our Prius is, is the gas electric, right? So you, you're not relying only on electric. You're not relying only on gas. It's a combination of the two that allow you to have the range that you need. And it really doesn't uh, affect your life in any way on how you're running that vehicle. It, whether you drive a, a regular you know, gasoline-powered vehicle, or you're driving a Prius, you don't know the difference. Right. There you go, folks. A 2025 Tundra Prius pickup coming. So for <laughs> more pickup truck and SUV news, make sure you check us out on pickuptrucktalk.com, social media, pickup truck talk. Type it in. You'll find it. Trust me, it's there. Thanks for watching. I'll see you down the road.